Welcome to Medical Myths, Legends, and Fairy Tales. I'm your host, Dr. Alan Christensen. Look, you know that between the latest online fads and the crazy media headlines, it's easier than ever to get confused about your health. And you and I just want to feel better and live longer. We want to know what works. And we can't wait for further studies. We need to make decisions today based on the best evidence we've got. Well, that's exactly what this show is here for. So let's get to it. Hi there, this is Dr. Linda Kashaba from Integrative Health. Would you like some help with your thyroid? We would absolutely love to help you out. And guess what? We can even do remote care. Please call us today at 480-657-0003 to set up your first appointment. If you mention code PODCAST20, you will get 20% off from your first visit. That phone number again is 480 480- 657-0003 and the code is podcast20. Can't wait to meet you. Okay, historic event here today. This is our first guest to have a repeat appearance. And the honor goes to Dr. Sarah Ballantyne. So she is a PhD in medical biophysics. You may know her as the Paleo Mom. She's also a New York Times bestselling author, world-renowned health expert. And yeah, just fan of all things science and all things science literacy and how to apply that to health topics. So uh, I brought Sarah on to talk through the role of insulin. You know, it's gotten a bad rap and like everything in the body, it has purposes and those purposes can be important. And in the case of health, it's essential. And in the case of disease, it can be a player in that as well. But I wanted to vindicate it as not being a bad guy. So. Sarah and I talked in great detail about this, you know, carbohydrate metabolism. Pretty fascinating to hear her own story about how her health went very bad from going low carbohydrate and all the many roles of biochemistry that they support. So please enjoy this time with uh, Dr. Sarah Ballantyne. Backstage, we just had a realization. This is my first repeat guest. Uh, Sarah, how you doing? I am so honored to be the first repeat guest. Hopefully the first <laughs> of many. Hopefully I paved the way sure. for all the other wonderful guests to come back on. Lots of awesome guests, but but you're, yeah, you're the first and this is going to be cool. So super, super important topic. And, you know, I'd love to start out with just hearing about a bit of your story on how you came to have a focus in health, nutrition, to go deep in this, what brought you in and how that makes today's topic relevant. So let's, let's, let's hear. Yeah. So I, I mean, I was a medical researcher. I I would now consider myself more of a a health educator um, than I I try to keep my foot in the door and and maintain connections in research labs, but I'm not actually in a lab on a day-to-day basis, pipetting things into tubes over and over and over again. Um, But I didn't, you know, I also was as a medical researcher in a you know, very high profile academic lab. I never, it never occurred to me to use that knowledge base and, and the, um, the, the huge amount that I understood about how the human body works to solve my health problems. Like I, I really struggled Mm. with, uh, morbidly obese and, uh, borderline type two diabetic, right? Metabolic syndrome, all, wow. all that standard stuff. I also had four autoimmune diseases. Um, and I used to joke that I sort of collected diagnoses the way other people collect rare stamps. Oh. Um, and, and it wasn't until I really got too sick to, to continue on in medical research that I really started what was my own personal health journey. But that was also what led me to start applying my scientific background to the problem of my own health. And it was actually losing 120 pounds on a low carb diet and nearly wow. breaking myself doing that. I mean, I, I really felt at the time that um, all of my health issues centered around my weight. And if I could just successfully lose weight, everything would resolve, right? Like that my life would be magic, sunshine and roses. And that turned out to be unequivocally false and not my experience in the slightest. I lost all that weight. It normalized my blood sugars and my blood pressure. And every other health condition that I had accumulated over the years was worse. Um, And some were um, really dramatically impacting my quality of life. I had irritable bowel syndrome and asthma and acid reflux and a variety of skin conditions. I had eczema, uh, psoriasis, 
another autoimmune skin condition called lichen planus. I was um, battling depression. I was having anxiety attacks. I was hypothyroid. I had very intense fibromyalgia pain. And it it was that realization that um, both that losing weight did not automatically make me healthy and make everything in my life perfect, which I really naively believed it would, but also that um, there was a diet link here that was much more complicated than calories in or calories out and and certainly much more complicated than carb grams or net carbs, you know, all the different things that I was paying attention to, to lose weight. And that was my entry point into understanding the paleo diet, the autoimmune protocol, um, that my whole nutrient density focus, my holistic approach, including lifestyle. And it was, it was that experience of really a low carb diet, making my health struggles so much more unbearable that actually launched, you know, what is now my career as a health educator. That's wild. So you, you dropped that much weight. So some of those conditions, it sounded like it sounded like some of those were present, but they worsened. But were some of those things emergent? Were some of those things new after the or around the weight loss process? Um, definitely the weight loss process. I think the the only thing that I would say was emergent throughout that process was the mental health challenges. Um, mm. So there was something about actively losing weight that triggered anxiety attacks. Um, and I would say everything else was present prior. But keep in mind that my health history up until that point involved a lot of yo-yo dieting. Um, so uh, it very well could have been in part driven by the metabolic damage that, that yo-yo dieting, dieting causes. Mm-hmm. Um, and I, I, you know, definitely looking back now and, you know, I've, because I've really c- committed my career to um, being a health educator and, and really, um, I spend most of my time reading scientific studies and trying to understand the context and the nuance and where, you know, results conflict and, and what could be behind that beyond just throwing out a study because it doesn't agree with my presupposed notions. That's awesome. And, um, really trying to communicate that to people in an actionable way. And as I've educated myself on, um, you know, the roles that insulin have in the human body that have nothing to do with glucose metabolism, as new studies have been performed that have have really put the final nail in the coffin to the insulin hypothesis of obesity. Um, so as this this new research has been performed over the last few years, and as I've really expanded my knowledge base on this topic, I can now look back at the health struggles that I had um, yo-yo dieting leading up to losing a lot of weight on a low carb diet, but then also how my health deteriorated as I lost weight. And I can look at that now and go, well, yeah, I mean, that, that was entirely predictable. I was also setting myself up to fail. I was setting myself up to just gain the weight back again. Uh, thank goodness I found a sort of nutrient dense, balanced macronutrient approach to land on and worked on those habits as part of this journey. Because I think that if I, if I had done what I think is so much more typical for people to um, lose weight and then, you know, following a, I would call a low carb diet, an extreme diet, um, Mm. to to lose weight using an an extreme approach like that, which really does impact um, hunger hormones. um, You lose a lot of lean uh, muscle mass, it suppresses thyroid function, you end up basically um, reducing your basal metabolic rate to the point where weight loss maintenance becomes next to impossible. And it's why um, it's why the, the statistics on successful weight loss um, maintenance, you know, five years mm-hmm. out from, from losing a substantial portion of your body weight are so sad. It's because... It's pretty scary stuff. Um, it really is. And I, I, you know, I will often tell people like, there's a million ways to lose weight. Um, there's only a few different ways to keep it off. And how you lose weight impacts how easy it is to keep off. And what it really boils down to is not using your body weight as the only metric of how you are defining whether or not you're healthy, but actually looking at things like, you know, 
blood markers, right? What uh, what's what's your inflammation? What uh, what does your lipid panel look like? What is your organ function like? Looking at things like your energy levels, how well you're sleeping, your mood. Um, do you enjoy life? Do you have fun? If someone tells you a joke, do you actually really laugh? I mean, those <laughs> those things I think are far far more important indicators than what the number is on the scale. And when you start to look at health in that, I think more robust way, right? Where I'm looking at. Um, I'm looking at a set of criteria that is beyond just what the scale says. Yeah. I think it becomes really obvious that um, it's more important to get healthy than to get thin. And that I would argue that getting healthy is a prerequisite for staying thin. So we get healthy to get thin, not get thin to get healthy. That was There was so much in there. I love the idea of you know, really laughing. When was the last time you really laughed yeah. at something? That was, that's huge. That's really insightful. You know, there's a lot of things you do by reflex, but are you emotionally present and are you really enjoying yourself? And, you know, was that genuine? I mean, that's, that's a huge insight someone could think about. And I love the discussion too about weight being too much of the obsession. I've often told people when they ask about how to lose weight, uh, the very easiest way to lose weight, uh, this can work for anyone. You can take off 10, 20, 30 pounds overnight, believe it or not. But the quickest way to weight loss is you leave one foot off the scale. <laughs> <laughs> yep, that, that works. Or uh, hold, hold, uh, lean on the countertop. That also That's right. uh, it's another great one. Um, another, another thing you can do is you can get a whole bunch of helium balloons and tie them mm -hmm. to your belt. <laughs> yeah. Um, and just carry them around all day. I, right. I but you wouldn't that, be a healthier, happier person for doing it. <laughs> likely not. Not unless balloons are really your thing. Uh, <laughs> but I, I think that, um, you know, we've been trained really since the 70s to think of health simplistically as, you know, what is, you know, what is your BMI? And, you know, meanwhile, we have all of these other things that that educate our quality of life much more so than what clothing size we fit in. And the science will tell us that your absolute weight is not anywhere near as important as your body composition as well. Yeah. Yeah. Something I'd like to expand just briefly for the listeners who may not be clear on this is the idea you talked about the carbohydrate insulin uh, model hypothesis. So the idea goes something like, Carbohydrates have this affinity for raising insulin in the body, and insulin plays some biochemical roles in facilitating the entry of uh, energy dense molecules into fat cells. And insulin causes fat to grow, is the idea. And therefore, one must eradicate insulin, lower insulin, to cause any weight loss to occur. And another extension of this I hear a lot is well, there's no such thing as an essential carbohydrate. You know, we've got amino acids that we require, we've got essential fatty acids, but there's no essential carbohydrate. So with if those premises were true and there wasn't really much beyond that, you could see how someone could reasonably think that this is really the only way that weight loss could occur is by carbohydrate restriction, that other variables are not relevant. And I don't know, I think that there are still, I think that idea is still quite prevalent. So let's, let's go into that a bit. Yeah, I think that, um, we love as humans, right? We love the simple solution, right? And what's been so powerful about the carbohydrate insulin hypothesis of obesity is that it really boils things down to uh, a couple of sound bites that are really easy, even for somebody without a science background, to just wrap their head around. And there's this direct actionable consequence, right? Don't don't eat fruit or wheat based products. And there's also a measurable outcome because when people eliminate carbohydrates, it tends to result in, it actually reduces caloric intake. So it's a tricky way of uh, getting yourself to, to consume fewer calories and then you lose weight. But there have been um, some really fantastic studies. Dr. Kevin Hall has really been the leader yeah. in, in testing this hypothesis. And he has shown through a series of incredibly well-designed studies, some with crossover designs, um, most of them in metabolic wards where like every calorie of food is being measured and controlled, every amount of ex exercise is being controlled. And he has shown that there's no benefit to a low carbohydrate uh, diet 
for weight loss beyond the caloric deficit that it causes. And he has shown actually that a uh, ketogenic style diet, which is sort of like the ultimate of low carb diets, Mm -hmm. actually results in more lean muscle mass than a uh, protein matched but more balanced fat and carbohydrate calorie matched control. So what's actually happening there is um, that we're losing more muscle per pound of fat compared to just working on portion control. And it emphasizes a couple of really important things. One is insulin is a super hormone. It is not just the thing that shuttles um, energy molecules into cells. It has a variety of essential signaling um, functions in basically every cell in the human body has insulin receptors. And as a result, it has a direct control over uh, thyroid hormone conversion, over protein um, synthesis in our muscles, over uh, bone mineralization in our bones. It has a direct impact on sex hormone regulation. It has a direct impact on memory and cognition. And when you start to look at the non-metabolic roles of insulin, you start to see this really, um, I think, important theme, which is that insulin is not something to purely minimize. Like, sure, insulin yeah. resistance is is not doing us any favors, but if you start to look at some of the adverse reactions in long-term low-carbohydrate or ketogenic diets, you start to see very thematically the same things that happen in type 2 diabetics because we need insulin in order to, you know, metabolize uh, energy molecules well, but we also need it to help, you know, convert pro-hormone T4 uh, into the... Um, active hormone, um, other way around. Um, we need, right. So we need to Mm -hmm, totally, we need insulin for, for thyroid hormone conversion. We need, uh, insulin for, uh, it actually helps to get, uh, amino acids into our muscles. So it helps to, uh, transport amino acids into muscle tissue while also driving, uh, muscle protein synthesis. So it helps to recover after a workout and also then protect, our lean mass while we're losing weight. Um, It's driving bone mineralization in the bone, so it helps to protect against osteoporosis, which of course we see at least in children with ketogenic diets who have higher bone turnover rates that there is a loss of um, bone mineral density. And we also see osteoporosis as a common uh, co-occurrence in in type 2 diabetics. Um, There's even studies now looking at mental health. And also with radical weight loss. Mm -hmm, Of course. And so I think that, you know, if we start to really respect that insulin is a, a vital signaling molecule. It is not just a metabolic hormone. It has a role in nearly every important tissue in our body. It also impacts our immune function, um, which is why we see, you know, increased susceptibility to infection in both uh, low-carb and ketogenic diet studies as well as in type 2 diabetics. It's because the immune system is not actually regulating itself well enough to successfully fight off an infectious agent. You start pulling on all these different strings and you go, well, how how can low carb be a good idea if we're not going to be consuming enough carbohydrates to stimulate enough insulin for all of these other roles that insulin has in the human body? So how about the no essential carbohydrate? Have you have any particular good good responses for that one or um I mean I think that it's um it's hard to measure, right? So this is this is one of the things that we we do with nutrients. Uh we label things as essential and non-essential based on what happens if you don't consume any. And uh right, if you um don't have any vitamin D, you get rickets, um, right? If you don't consume any vitamin C, you get scurvy. And we have these nutrients that we label as essential because we can identify a disease of deficiency. And everything that gets labeled as non-essential, for example, plant phytochemicals um, or an essential carbohydrate, we Dietary know fibers, right? Fibers. We know we know from studies that they're incredibly important from health for, from a health standpoint, right? That they're they're definitely health promoting, uh, food molecules. However, we don't have, uh, a, 
occurrence of deficiency disease because it is so challenging to consume little of enough of these things to drive those deficiency diseases. So then we label it as non-essential. But we know with carbohydrates, right, we know they are the preferred fuel source uh, for producing adenosine triphosphate through the citric acid cycle in every single cell. <laughs> um, I would argue that that's a pretty good indicator of it being an essential nutrient. And mm. we also know that there is an incredibly important influence on our gut microbiomes from carbohydrate mm. intake. Yeah. And we know now, I mean, the, the amount of information we've learned about the gut microbiome in the last three to four years has been astounding. Astounding. We now can link every chronic illness to some form of gut dysbiosis. So some either really important probiotic bacteria that are missing or some kind of pathogenic bacteria that are overgrowing or both or loss of diversity, right? We've got all these different ways of measuring a abnormal gut microbial community. And we can now link that to all different forms of cancer, cardiovascular disease, diabetes, obesity, chronic kidney disease, osteoporosis, uh, a huge variety of mental health challenges, neurological disorders, neurodegenerative disease, autoimmune disease, asthma, allergies. We can now withdraw this straight line between what the gut microbiome is doing and basically every chronic illness that erodes our quality of life in a modern society. And one of the things that we're learning about the gut microbiome is that it is quite carbohydrate sensitive, especially um, some uh, keystone species of what are called archaea, which are not actually bacteria. They're a you know, different domain of life, but they're sort of bacteria-like. Hmm. And there's a bunch of um, important ones that are methane degraders. So they're called uh, methanobrevibacter. And the they are most sensitive to our dietary carbohydrate consumption, um, especially, right, they really love those like high amylose starches that are in like root mm -hmm. vegetables, um, starchy fruit, right, like winter squash or plantains. And, um, and they uh, are a keystone species. So they actually help to create an environment in our guts where dozens of other really important probiotic species can grow. So if you are missing methanobrevibacter, you basically then lose the ability to grow bifidobacterium, which everyone understands because we, we're taking all these probiotic supplements with bifidobacterium in them. Right. But we actually see that if you put people on a low-carb diet, their uh, bifidobacterium levels tank. Um, so does rosburia, mm -hmm. which is another um, genus of really important probiotic bacteria. And there was a there was a fascinating study just published a few months ago that looked at the paleo diet, um, mm -hmm. but it was a low carb implementation of paleo. So these were people who were eating tons of non starchy vegetables. So they were getting upwards of thirty grams of fiber a day, which definitely meets USDA guidelines. Uh, most people would look at that and go, "You're you know you're winning on fiber," but they were consuming about ninety grams of total carbohydrates a day. So about you know oh, wow. sixty grams net. Um, so they're mostly eating, you know, broccoli and leafy greens and things like that. And they showed that these people on a long-term paleo diet had reduced bifidobacterium, reduced rosburia. They didn't measure uh, methanobrevibacter because that's a, a little bit, um, most of the analyses are still just focused on bacteria when we're looking at the gut microbiome. But they showed an increase in production of uh, TMA by our gut bacteria, which is metabolized into TMAO in our liver, which is linked with cardiovascular disease and cancer, um, that they attributed to both this loss of bifidobacterium, which work actually in conjunction with uh, archaea to metabolize uh, TMA as a methane-based molecule. Um, so this loss of important bacteria that help to process TMA, as well as an increase in a genus called Hungatella, which is known to produce TMA. And so they were actually able to draw a straight line between this low-carb version of a paleo diet and increased cardiovascular disease risk. And there's certainly, right, there's some interesting studies now um, showing that uh, while there's some hypothesized mechanisms behind how TMAO may actually directly contribute to cardiovascular disease or cancer, um, there's also some thoughts among researchers that it may just more be an indicator molecule. So it's more of yeah. a uh, molecule showing that some bad 
bad <laughs> physiological things are going on, and it may not actually be the culprit molecule. Um, mm -hmm. But you can even think of it as a indicator of a of gut dysbiosis at this point because of the direct line between. Uh, what type of bacteria are growing in our gut and whether or not TMA is being produced. And I think this this just adds to our understanding of the importance of, obviously, we're not going to eat all the sugar, right? I, I don't want to say that uh, right. it's like free-for-all on the carbohydrates, bread. right? Yeah. But that whole food sources of carbohydrates, like root vegetables, like fruit, we've lumped them in to the same category as white sugar as a carbohydrate. And these are incredibly nutrient dense foods with um, carbohydrates. We have, you know, a huge variety of studies showing that uh, root vegetables are uniquely beneficial for our gut microbiomes, like above and beyond just being vegetables. Um, but you can say that about basically every family of vegetables, like the onion family is uniquely beneficial <laughs> yeah. and the broccoli family is uniquely beneficial. But we we have this now, this collection of scientific evidence showing that root vegetables, that uh, fruit are so beneficial for our health as nutrient-dense foods. They're full of vitamins and minerals. They contain fiber types that are really important for our gut bacteria. And we have this whole collection of studies showing that higher vegetable and fruit consumption, they're almost always lumped together decreases uh, all-cause mortality, right? A general measure of, of health and longevity decreases uh, all cardiovascular disease mortality and all cancer mortality decreases uh, disease risk in general. Um, there's even been studies in chronic kidney disease, stage four chronic kidney disease, people who are on dialysis who can restore kidney function just by eating more fresh fruits and vegetables. They're wow. not doing a low carb version of that. They are, you know, basically giving these people's like grocery bags full of fresh fruits and vegetables and say, go home and eat this. And it's actually restoring kidney function. It's phenomenal. The huge body of scientific evidence showing that, you know, vegetables of all kind, including those ones that contain carbohydrates like sweet potatoes <laughs> and fruit are really fundamental for our long-term health. And it's crazy to me that this simplistic idea of insulin helping um, triglycerides get into fat cells has driven this demonization of this these incredibly healthy foods to the detriment of human health. That's awesome. Yeah, a couple couple things you mentioned about how TMAO may be more of just a marker of things going wrong. And I think that's probably a better view of insulin. It seems that it's less of a real cause of harm as it is a marker of the body just being in a high fuel state. Well, I think I think that's exactly right. And I, I think the you know the evidence is, for example, knowing that um, inflammation causes insulin resistance. Right? If you're inflamed from whatever. Um, you know, it's it's the inflammation that is the problem, not necessarily the insulin resistance, although the insulin resistance certainly isn't helping you. If you have a lot of um, free fatty acids in your blood, um, that drives insulin resistance. Um, I think one of the things that is super interesting to me is the amount of scientific evidence now showing that our insulin sensitivity is probably more of a direct reflection of our lifestyle than of our diet. Like, yes, eating all the sugar, again, I really want to emphasize that eating all the sugar is not a good choice. Um, but our how sensitive our insulin is, right? So that means like how high is your fasting blood glucose in the morning? All of those things that we measure to, you know, hemoglobin A1C, all these things we measure to look at how insulin sensitive or insulin resistant we are, are actually directly impacted by how much sleep we're getting, the quality of our sleep, our stress levels, and our activity. And we can actually restore insulin sensitivity much faster by dialing in lifestyle factors than by doing anything to do with our diet. You know, I'm sure you've seen this, but there's been studies that some of the listeners may not have heard about showing that you can make someone look diabetic by compromising sleep for one yes. single night. Oh, for oh, I, I mean, it's so compelling. Um, and they've they've now they've got studies now in animals and in humans, um, and they've done it in a bunch of different ways. So they've done things like sleep restricted um, for for a night. So you know, had somebody pull an all nighter and then measured their um, insulin sensitivity in the morning and gone, oh, look, you're diabetic now. 
Um, they've done things like do three to five nights of partial sleep where you're only getting four or five hours of sleep and shown the same effect. Um, there was a um, an abstract um, uh, that was presented at, um, I think it was obesity conference, um, which was a subset of FASEB, I think a few years ago that, uh, it was in a dog model, but they literally compared the, uh, night of lost sleep and, and the insulin, uh, resistance that that caused to six months of a Western style diet, which means all the fast wow. food and showed that the insulin resistance was worse after a night of lost sleep than it was from six months of this diet that is known to induce type 2 diabetes in dogs. Oh, my goodness. And, oh. um, and it's, to me, it's, it's because we're also talking about the context of a society that on average does not value sleep anymore. Um, we've got all of these idioms to, um, you know, make sleep look like it's, um, something that weak people do, right? Like I literally had a um, med student that I mentored who would just say, oh, sleep's for the weak. That was her mantra. Wow. I mean, to get through an MD PhD program. Um, and, uh, you know, I'll sleep when I'm dead, right? We have all of these different phrases that we use. And, uh, you know, most, m the average person sleeps with whatever time they have left at the end of the day after they've gone wow. through their to-do list. And meanwhile, Getting eight hours of sleep every single night is one of the best things we can do to support insulin sensitivity. There are studies showing that even shortchanging ourselves by 30 minutes of sleep a night only on weeknights, so only Monday through Friday, getting seven and a half hours instead of eight hours on those days, doesn't matter how much you sleep on the weekends, increases our risk of uh, developing insulin resistance by like 38%. Oh, my goodness. It's, it's scary. You know one one little also angle on that. I was talking with some health entrepreneurs this last weekend and I was telling them some things, trying to get them to take better care of themselves, which yes. sadly- That's you, a hard sell a, for entrepreneurs. We, we have a lot of the same friends. Yeah. Sadly, a lot of them don't. But I was talking about how, as you were saying about sleep is for the week or whatnot, the other thing I'll hear a lot as a comeback as well is, you know, I get I personally do well without all that much. And so the statement I made to preempt that was, uh, the other issue about sleep is that you impair your capacity for self-judgment. You know, we, we, we understand that. Like I told them, I don't actually really, I don't really not drink, but I don't really drink. I, the joke is that I try to get in a six pack of beer each year and some years I fall short, <laughs> but, but I'm, I'm as white as they get out on the dance floor. But if you, if I had several drinks, I might think that I wasn't, you know, I might right. think my, my self judgment can become impaired. And that's what lack of sleep does. You think, oh, I'm doing great on five hours of sleep. No, you're not. You're just not, you're, you're, you're dancing drunk is what you're doing. <laughs> yeah. There's actually a whole pile of studies showing that lack of sleep. And this is my, always my pitch to entrepreneurs. Um, that it impacts cognitive function. So it actually is impacting, for example, your working memory, but it's also impacting your ability to collaborate. So people don't, um, they don't have collaborative skills when they're not getting enough sleep, which is like fundamental for being a successful yeah. business person. Um, it impacts your ability to problem solve. Um, so there's all different ways of measuring that. And basically every way of measuring it, we show that, uh, and this doesn't have to be a huge sleep deficit to impact cognitive function. and. Um, um, one of my favorite things is you're the less sleep you're getting, the worse the situation probably is because people on average tend to overreport how much sleep they're getting by about 20 minutes. So oh, wow. okay. this, this basically means that we count, you know, when you say how much sleep did you get last night, you count when you last saw the clock, like maybe it's when you turned out the light, but if you're a clock watcher, what was the last time I saw on the clock versus when my alarm went off and you do that math and it's just, you know, subtraction, but base 12. So it's hard. Um, and so, so that's how much sleep you think you got, but we have uh, normal, right? Our normal sleep cycle includes arousals. Um, and it's, it's normal when you actually measure total sleep versus perceived sleep, that the amount of sleep we're actually getting is on average 20 minutes less, but the less mm. sleep you get, the more likely you are to overreport sleep by a larger margin. Oh my goodness, that's hilarious. So if that's, you get oh, less wow. than six hours of sleep per night, you on average overreport your sleep by an hour and 20 minutes. Oh my goodness. Right. What a bizarre wrinkle that amplifies it all. Yeah. Um, so, you know, I like to tell people like you you might think you're doing okay, but if you're on the bevel here and looking at all of this, 
all of this interesting um, research showing increased disease risk with less than six hours of sleep per night. So it basically increases risk of obesity, diabetes, cardiovascular disease. Um, there's emerging evidence with autoimmune disease. Um, the, the data on cancer is actually probably the only area in which sleep sleep impacts your um, survivability. Um, so we know that how much mm. sleep you get upon diagnosis can be a predictor of outcome, but maybe not actually impacting cancer incidence. Disease onset, huh? Um, but there, there's this, I mean, I'm still, right? It, getting less than six hours of sleep per night doubles your risk of stroke, right? So like it's, it, there's mm. some really big factors there. Um, increases your risk of diabetes by 2.4 fold. Um, and so we have, we have all of this research showing that, you know, ideally we should be getting probably eight to nine hours. Uh, six hours is where things really, the wheels start to fall off the cart. And if you think you're walking this line of six hours, yeah, you're probably, mm -hmm. you're probably not. You're probably getting, you know, less than five hours and uh, look at all of these scary statistics. What a thing. So if you're not sleeping much, you're not even having a good clue about how much you're sleeping. Right. <laughs> We'll be right back after word from Integrative Health. We hope you are enjoying this episode of Medical Myths, Legends, and Fairy Tales. This is Dr. Linda Koshaba at Integrative Healthcare. So often we hear from our patients that their primary care physician has told them that their thyroid and hormone levels are fine and they shouldn't worry. But the patients still have symptoms of severe fatigue, thinning hair, and weight issues. Unfortunately, this is too common with thyroid care. The good news is that we can help. There is hope. The doctors at Integrative Health, including myself, specialize in naturally treating thyroid, hormone, and adrenal issues. We would love to get you started on the path of ideal health. From the comfort of your own home, you can actually get treatment with one of our doctors at Integrative Health via a telemedicine appointment. Go to integrativehealthcare.com and become a new patient today. If you use the code PODCAST20, you get 20% off your new patient visit. Again, that website is integrativehealthcare.com and use code PODCAST20. Get back on the road to thriving. And now back for more medical myths, legends, and fairy tales. You know, one thing I want to go back to just briefly mm -hmm. because I'm, I'm hearing someone out there in their head this is rewinding a little ways about vegetables and fruits. I'm hearing inside someone's head saying, but fruit has sugar and sugar is bad. <laughs> right. Um, you know, fruit has sugar that is incorporated into the matrix of the food that uh, part of that molecular structure includes vitamins and minerals that are fundamental for metabolism. Um, that includes fermentable substrate that helps to feed a healthy and diverse gut microbiome. And um, the research shows that whole fruit doesn't impact diabetes risk. Juice does, interestingly. So once you, once you separate the sugar, even if you're getting some vitamins into the juice, once you separate that from really, you know, fiber and a lot of the things that are, a lot of the like polyphenols tend to be bound up in fiber. Um, so a lot of the antioxidant phytochemicals are, are in there. Um, but the research is, is very unequivocal that high fruit consumption, even when fructose is getting upwards to 40 or 45 grams of total fructose per day, that mm -hmm. that level of, of fruit consumption does not increase disease risk, that it doesn't increase weight gain. Um, you know, I think that it really has to do with, uh, in this case, it's, right, it's not an isolated sugar. It's uh, processed differently. It is digested more slowly because it's part of this, you know, whole food matrix that needs to be broken down in our digestive tracts. And it's packaged with all of the different nutrients that our bodies need to be able to process it in a healthy way, right? And then a way that's not, right, it's wrapped up with all these wonderful antioxidant uh, vitamins, um, antioxidant phytochemicals that helps to combat the oxidative uh, damage of, well, you know, being an aerobic organism, really. I mean, anytime we use energy, yeah. we're creating oxygen radicals. Um, yep. But our fruit can be some of our best sources. And what's really fascinating is that those... Um, fructose-based structures in 
fruit actually appear to be some really important um, carbohydrates for our gut microbiome as well. So um, I, I, I mean, I wholeheartedly endorse fruit. And I, I think that when you start getting rid of junk food and refined carbohydrates, fruit becomes such a wonderful treat. And it is really challenging to consume enough fruit to start getting into fructose toxicity range. You know, I'd seen working on the last book about liver disease, uh, many studies about dietary fruit intake and even in relevant grams of fructose still having a proportionate beneficial dose related effect upon lowering risk for fatty liver disease. So, so yeah, the net effect in, in actual humans in the real world, despite what someone could hypothesize about the chemistry, the net effect is positive. But I think the the chemistry hypothesis that would um, lead somebody to demonize fruit is a simplification of what yeah. is in that food, right? So we're looking at fruit mm -hmm. purely as a source of sugar, but it's not. It's um, Fruit has some really amazing fiber types. There's um, studies showing that the apple family is uniquely beneficial for the gut microbiome. Berries are uniquely beneficial. Citrus family is uniquely beneficial. Like we can see that each one of these, you know, this is now taxonomy, right? So each one of these families of foods has something unique to offer our gut bacteria. And one of the things we know about our gut bacteria is many of them and many of the most important ones actually are not very good multitaskers in terms of the, the food that they want to eat. So some, some of the bacteria that will live in your gut no matter what mm. you do, they can digest just about anything that you eat. But some of the most beneficial, like bifidobacterium, they really only thrive on a very specific substrate. And huh. the details are really important. And this is why whole food sources of fiber is really the only way to go. You really can't support a, a healthy and diverse gut microbiome with any kind of fiber supplement at this point. And it's mm -hmm. because very small differences in fiber structure changes the accessibility of that fiber in terms of what species of bacteria it's going to feed. And so the only way to get fiber diversity is to consume a, a diverse range of fresh fruits and vegetables. And um, with fruit, we know that fruit, different fruit families have something unique to offer our gut microbiome that helps to increase microbial diversity, which is the number one hallmark of a healthy gut microbiome. That's awesome. I remember in early days of practice, I was arguing a bit with someone about saying basically how fruit was was not fruit sugar was not the same as food sugar. And and my my quick response was, well, it's got fiber. You know, fiber makes it different. And so the comeback that I got from a I don't know, a clever enough patient was, well, what if I pour some Metamucil in my Coke? <laughs> <laughs> like, I, no, that's... <laughs> I would not recommend straight psyllium husk fiber. No, straight cellulose. Yeah, no, it's not... Uh, not not gonna not gonna have the same effect. That's for sure. Although although I would predict that if someone did regularly add it to the co their coke, I predict they would decrease their coke consumption. <laughs> um, yes, I would definitely say. Um, I'm, my guess is the the impact on on appetite would be different. But, you know, there's all this research now showing that. Um, well, I mean, just they, they wouldn't like it. It would be also, all it would also be not, <laughs> it would be not taste, especially that orange flavor mixed in with the Coke that can't be. Oh, good. wow. <laughs> um, but actually, interestingly to, um, the, uh, Metamucil type fiber supplements do occasionally cause bowel obstruction. <laughs> so right. there's also this whole other thing of, you know, and it really boils down to our, our digestive tracts are not well adapted to consuming large amounts of one fiber type. So we saw this a few years ago, right? There was this, um, I think this fad is mostly past of adding uh, potato starch to smoothies um, mm. to add resistant starch to help feed the gut microbiome. And anytime that you start looking at inulin fiber, right? Or uh, psyllium just husk fiber, thing. just one thing, you are basically overfeeding now a small subgroup of bacteria. And you can have gut dysbiosis by having an overgrowth of probiotic species. Um, mm -hmm. and, and you get that by um, selecting for them, right? You're, you're creating a situation where you're taking high-dose probiotics and fiber supplements, and you're basically creating a condition now where only, uh, again, you know, a, a couple dozen species can grow. They might be desirable species, but 
you still end up losing diversity. And there's some really compelling evidence now showing that the more species we can have growing in our in our guts, the more resilient our gut microbial community is to perturbation. Yeah. Um, so things that can change our gut bacteria. I mean, oh, the list is, I mean, we'll be here for the next three hours. We're start listing yeah. everything that can yeah. change our gut bacteria oh, it's just, dramatically. It's just everything. Pretty much. Any, any diet factor, any nutrient, uh, any lifestyle, um, any Mental toxin emotional. exposure. Um, Right. Any any kind of antimicrobial of any kind, any supplement, any drug, right? Pretty much anything is going to um, create some kind of disturbance in the gut microbiome. Some of I mean, obviously, there's positive effects, too. Right. If you're eating a variety of fruits and vegetables and seafood and a nutrient dense diet, those are all factors that are going to help to increase diversity. Losing any of those impacts the gut microbiome. The more diversity we have the lower the effect of any one you know negative factor and that means that our gut you know microbes are going to bounce back after a course of antibiotics if um you know if the situation arises where that's going to be a life-saving intervention which happens that's why antibiotics are magical obviously not to take for no reason (laughs) but when they save your life like, yeah. that's awesome. And then if you've been doing all of the great things to support a healthy gut microbiome, which involves eating whole food sources of carbohydrates like root vegetables and fruit ahead of time, your gut microbiome is going to bounce back after that course of antibiotics um, in, in a much more robust way than somebody who didn't start with a diverse gut microbiome. <laughs> that's awesome. You know, one thing, one thing you might get a kick out of, there was a, a friend of a health expert friend of mine and very adamantly severe, low carb and complaining about various symptoms, which I thought could have been related. And he was really, really stuck on the no essential carbohydrate idea. Mm-hmm. And there's no reason to consume them. And my first, my first little responses with him, I didn't think were helpful or effective. And I thought about it a bit further. And then I, I did, did the math on a few things. So I guess one quick concept is, is the healthiest diet the one that minimally meets requirements? You know, do you, do you avoid that 11th milligram of vitamin C because 10 was enough or you know, right. so there's, there's, there's that. But the other thing I thought through was, okay, so essential nutrients. So the vitamins and minerals, we know there's things that are there. We know they're essential. You get sick without them. Like you said, the deficiency diseases. Well, that's, that's not a whole lot. You know, that's non-caloric. So let's put that here. And then so for essential macronutrients, we've got essential amino acids, which are, you know, a function of body composition, body size, Mm -hmm. uh, but not a ton, really. You know, you could get by on a few hundred calories just from the most rate limiting amino acids and not have an overt deficiency. Then we've got essential fatty acids. We've just got linoleic and linolenic, and the quantities we need aren't very high. You know, we've seen people on total parenteral nutrition or studies on kids who are only on skim milk. And yeah, they got sick, but reversing that, it didn't take much at all. So now we've met all of our essential requirements. You're not even above 300 calories. Yeah. You are not above 300 calories. You can't stop eating then. <laughs> no, you can't. <laughs> not and expect your life to go on. Um, no. <laughs> I, I think, and I think this is why the nomenclature of essential versus non-essential nutrient is so misleading. Because saying that you'll die without enough of it is very different than making a statement of how much you need to be optimally healthy. And right now, Mm -hmm. even our daily values, right, our recommended daily allowances are all based on uh, what happens, like at what level do you start to show signs of inadequacy, Um, which can be a little bit different than signs of deficiency, right? But it's it's basically, you know, those levels are set such that 98-ish percent of the population would not show a direct symptom related to inadequate levels of that nutrient. It's a very different way of looking at it compared to how much of right my um, riboflavin do I need to be optimally healthy. And the, the mm-hmm. reason why we don't uh, have a recommended amount of vitamins and minerals for optimal health is because it's incredibly challenging for us to measure with our current technologies. We don't have a way of saying this person is 65% healthy and this person is 80% healthy. We can look at mm. you know lipid panels and inflammation markers, but that's a really only a small piece of the story. 
And until we have a way of quantifying how real your laugh was after that joke that someone told. (laughs) I I love that. That was the best thing. (laughs) Then then we don't have a way of really measuring optimal health. It's much easier for us to measure disease. And so to say, this is how much you need to not have disease. I I mean, I I really do think that we need to be looking at all of those um, recommended daily allowances with this very huge grain of salt. Uh, this is a minimum that we need to not have deficiency. That's different than saying that's how much I need to be healthy. Well, you know, and if they actually could make uh, some obtuse number that was an estimate of what would be optimal amounts, then somebody could make a pill and say, here you go. Now let's hit Burger King. <laughs> um, yes, that will happen. <laughs> yes. Um, I mean, and, you know, and then we can sort of talk about the you know, the challenges with um, supplements is not just absorbability and not just synergy, right? You know, in foods, we tend to have the most absorbable forms of nutrients um, in synergistic quantities with other nutrients that are required for absorption or utilization, right? It tends to already be packaged up in the right, you know, formula in foods. Um, but we have this other issue of um, there's 12,000 approximately different uh, plant phytochemicals that have been identified. Mm. We understand roughly the benefits of a few hundred different of them, mostly the polyphenols. Um, and so, you know, there's 11 and a half ish thousand phytochemicals out there. We can say that. The more phytochemicals you consume, because that's something that's directly proportional to your vegetable and fruit intake, generally the better your health outcomes. Um, We can't tell you what happens if you don't consume enough phytochemicals because that's such an unusual situation. Um, I mean, it might become something that happens now with things like carnivore diets becoming a fad. and Soylent. There is soylent. Um, Yeah. yeah. So I, I think that... Um, we're, we're at a point right now where we can't even, we can't even determine the essential nature of a nutrient, let alone how much we really need, let alone in what form and in what quantities with someone else, the amount of information, just the amount of human knowledge that needs to be expanded before we could even start to formulate a capsule is tremendous in this regard. And um, I think it's highly unlikely that we would ever be able to reproduce what is already naturally occurring in whole foods um, in a capsule that would actually do the same job. So, at, at, and what it seems to come down to is of all those things that we do best with, with a variety in whole foods, carbohydrates are a part of that. Yes. And not something to be feared or or demonized um, and not even something, I think, as a, a primary point of manipulation. I think that, you know, we have a lot more, um, a lot more information in the scientific literature showing that uh, fat intake or protein intake are more uh, likely targets for manipulation for health outcomes. So for example, if you have one or two copies of the APOE4 gene, you are a person Mm. who is going to have higher Alzheimer's risk and cardiovascular disease risk with a higher fat diet. So that makes fat a point of manipulation for that approximately 25% of the population. Mm -hmm. Um, We know that if weight loss is your goal, um, hopefully health is now your goal after listening to this podcast. But if if part of that encapsulates weight loss, we know that higher protein intake along with activity and adequate sleep is the best way to preserve lean muscle mass through weight loss um, as well as basal metabolic so rate. And yep. so that makes protein intake a, a point of manipulation and not that extremes of either of those is going to be appropriate for anybody. I really think that the... The ranges at which we are optimally healthy in terms of carbohydrate, fat, and protein grams are not as extreme as fad diets would lead you to believe. I think roughly balanced, but we really don't see issues with high carbohydrate intake until about 60% of calories from carbohydrates. Um, you know, and a lot of those studies, too, were really just markers of socioeconomic status. Mm-hmm. When, you're, when you're above that, you're living off of white rice. Right. And so, um, 
we also don't have a good way at this point because a whole food based diet or a nutrient focused diet, which would be my my top two, you know, dietary strategies that I would recommend, um, irregardless of somebody's health goals, um, that has been made so unusual due to the changes in the food supply since the 1950s that we yeah. don't have big populations of people just following a, you know, like grandma's cooking style diet where I grew a bunch of my vegetables in my backyard and I bought my meat from my butcher and my <laughs> fish from the fishmonger and had my milk was from the cows down the road and delivered to my doorstep each morning. We don't have enough people who are following that style diet anymore to be able to do any kind of population studies to tease out a signal in terms of how that type of whole food nutrient density focus impacts health. So ev everything that we have is sort of muddied with trans fats and high saturated fat and added yeah. sugars and high fructose corn syrup and tons of sodium and uh, having all the essential vitamins and minerals stripped out of the food. Like that is the dominant effect that we see in population studies is the effect of refined and manufactured foods that it's it's well, not possible it, easily anyways to devise a study that would test beyond that. And the context of those foods in often states of excess fuel, low mobility, mm -hmm. low social connection and cohesion, you know, how those things play out in that full context, it's, it's, all, it's all inseparable. And, you know, we also know, you know, to bring things back to, for example, the importance of, of lifestyle factors for, for insulin sensitivity, um, we know that our diet choices are not in isolation. Like, not only do they tend to reflect socioeconomic class, but things mm -hmm. like how much sleep we're getting is impacting our diet choices. If you uh, don't, you know, if you get six hours sleep or less per night, you are vastly more likely to choose fast food and junk food over whole fruits and vegetables. Um, if you are stressed, you you know that can drive cravings for energy dense foods. Um, if you are sedentary, we know that that is a huge physical stressor, um, and so we. We can't look at, um, I don't think we can look at any one nutrient, macro or micro, in isolation because all of these different choices are contributing to our total health and the choices impact each other. Getting enough sleep makes it easier to choose whole foods and, and have a nutrient-focused diet. Getting enough sleep helps regulate our stress. Regulating our stress helps our sleep quality be better. Getting more exercise helps to regulate sleep and stress. And they all impact the gut microbiome. Sleep and stress and activity too are <laughs> independent contributors to the um, to what species of bacteria are happily growing in, in our guts. And so I think, you know, just like we can't simplistically evaluate our health based on the number of on the scale, we can't simplistically impact our health by manipulating one factor. This is this has been awesome stuff. This has been a blast. <laughs> Sarah, thank you so much for your time with us today. Thank you so I I love these kinds of nerdy conversations. This is what I live for. <laughs> um, and thank you again. It's such an honor to be your first repeat guest. Well, I've got to I've got to warn you of something. There's a pitfall here. Um, as we've been talking, I've got like a lot more episodes that popped up in my head. So, <laughs> so I might be your first three three times guest and your first four times guest. At five, I get a jacket, right? That's how it works. <laughs> I guess. <laughs> <laughs> well, we've got some Frequent time to plan that out. <laughs> yeah. Oh, have an awesome day, Sarah. I really appreciate this. Oh, thank you yeah. so much. All right, and thank you guys for tuning in and. Please, please hear that. It's not about being fearful of food or fearful of some pattern. It's about really just the whole the whole picture. So we'll get some links here for the Paleo Mom and Sarah's work, Sarah's books. And please check that out further. In the meantime, take great care. And we'll see you again real soon. Bye-bye. Hey, Dr. Christensen here. Thanks so much for joining me for another episode. Is there a topic you'd like me to cover? I'd love to hear from you. Just go to Dr. Alan Christensen on Facebook or Instagram, write your question, and use the hashtag medical myths. Did you find this show helpful? If so, please take a minute and leave us a rating on iTunes so that others can know. Thanks much. I'll be back with you real soon. Bye-bye.